Hello and welcome back to Digital Assets Daily. Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, wherever you are in your corner of the world. Got a handful of articles I want to discuss and share a perspective as I went through the articles. Now, the big win for Ripple and Friday's hearing as it seeks to pin down the SEC for lack of fair notice. On Friday's hearing, Ripple revealed that it had already given the SEC access to two memos by its lawyers from 2012 and 2015. And according to one attorney, Ripple looks set to win the battle on whether there was fair notice by the SEC regarding XRP's status, and this could collapse the regulator's case. And again, if you remember, 2015 was the uh, thin cent settlement where it stated that XRP was a currency. Also, too, the uh, case pretty much went very well, I would think, in their favor in regards to the fair notice. And I believe, you know, we'll see how the rest of this plays out. But I think that that's pretty significant even though it may be a minor win for now but we'll see how this goes also too here was the major setup for the rest of today's video the bank of canada crypto highly risky despite institutional adoption and stating that crypto volatility is an emerging vulnerability to canada's financial system while stable coins pose risk for the country's monetary system the Bank of Canada said. Now stating price volatility stemming from speculative demand remains an important obstacle to the wide acceptance of crypto assets as a means of payment. Despite the broadening institutional interest in crypto assets, they continue to be considered high risk because of their intrinsic value is hard to establish. Now getting into the article, the warning comes shortly after the crypto market saw one of its wildest crashes in history, wiping out about one trillion USD in market value in a matter of days after surging above 64,000 last month. Bitcoin experienced a massive sell-off, tumbling to nearly touch 30,000 USD on Wednesday, marking another milestone of extreme volatility on crypto markets. And if you follow this channel very closely, then you will understand that the past few months I have shown the different angles, the different perspectives, and the different attacks from all over on Bitcoin. Now, the reason I'm going to highlight the Bitcoin thing here is Bank of Canada is the headline of this article. And here's where it gets very exciting. Some of you may know this some of you may have never seen it and obviously the new investors are going to be very excited i think especially if you hold xrp and xlm there are many i can continue to add to this discussion but the focus is these two specifically for great reason as they seem to do a lot of similar um, focus as far as the design one is more wholesale and one is more focused retail. Now let's dive in. Now here, the Bank of Canada stating crypto money perspective of a couple of Canadian central bankers. And again, remember that they were saying the volatility was Bitcoin. All right, let's get into that. The uh, chart that actually let's go back. It skipped one here. And the... Um, Article of discussion, do cryptocurrency offer something fundamentally new, given the rapid growth and popularization of crypto assets since their creation? The natural question is whether aspiring cryptocurrencies promise something fundamentally new in terms of economic services. Is the label revolutionary, in quote, justified in that they could eventually remove the use for trusted third parties? And in some cases, the ability to modify this ledger to open all uh, Bitcoin and Litecoin, while in others, is restricted to pre-approved users. This latter case is termed a permission blockchain using Ripple and Hyperledger as an example. 
And the key feature of blockchain systems is that the records are ordered and bundled in blocks that are linked together to form a database of every transaction ever made. And if you pay attention to the recent video where I showed one of the uh, news hosts on TV stating uh, her opinion about blockchain but not really understanding that the database records every single transaction that was something i highlighted in a previous video so the blockchain structure is innovative because it makes older records immutable and allows information sharing among all participants in this way the blockchain constitutes a shared communal memory for the users and blockchain tech allows records to exist in a decentralized way in a digital context and most important is the ability to append such a digital ledger through a distributed consensus mechanism among strangers without recourse to a centralized authority and this distinguishes it from other types of record keeping and you notice it's the consensus mechanism which I will highlight again shortly in this video now here the global look at central bank digital currencies and again I want to highlight an aspect here um, from the Bank of Canada and this is going to make a lot more sense as we continue to move forward. Project Ubin, Jasper, the Monetary Authority of Singapore, and the Bank of Canada. Project Ubin began as a collaborative project across the Monetary Authority of Singapore, MAS, and the Association of Banks in Singapore, ABS, and several international financial institutions to explore the use of distributed ledger technology for clearing and settlement use cases. The Ubin project was a multi-year, multi-phase project currently all five phases have been completed, and in phase four, the MAS and Bank of Canada conducted a successful cross-border payment experiment using CBDCs. And looking ahead, their research and experimentation from Project Ubin is helping to shape future live commercial solutions that leverage DLT and tokenized fiat, and the latter could include central bank-issued digital currency. I'm not going to go through every single one of these as there is an extreme amount um, <laughs> in regards to the highlighting of the Bank of Canada. So the Bank of Canada is one of a handful of central banks that have actively researched CBDCs publicly since 2016. And the central bank has a number of ongoing working papers that is testing piloted wholesale implementations through a four-phase project known as Project JASPER. In early 2000, it concluded that the bank does not yet see a compelling case to issue a Canadian digital dollar. Instead, the BOC has issued a contingency plan to prepare for scenarios that could warrant the launch of a CBDC. And again, there's uh, a lot of content here to cover. And I'm going to try and just hit the points that I need to make this uh, video completely retain its focus. And again, the Bank of canada as you saw in there it said testing piloted wholesale implementations also too if you go to the bank of canada we have canada's major payment systems and what are their payment systems they have the automated clearing settlement system and payments canada i'm going to try and be very brief with this as well if you click on that link, these transactions will settle on the books of the Bank of Canada at the end of the day. That is their large value transfer system. And then you have the automated clearing settlement system. And the automated clearing settlement system, let's just highlight that for you in case you are viewing. If you're working or driving, please do not look at your screen. Feel free to play this again later or at another time when you are safe. So the Automated Clearing Settlement System, ACSS, is owned and operated by Payments Canada. Now Payments Canada, the Payments Canada is a not-for-profit organization created by an Act of Parliament in 1980 under the Canadian Payments Association Act, and the Act was replaced in 2001 by Canadian Payments Act, the CP Act. The CP Act underwent uh, significant amendments in 2014 to update the governance and accountability frameworks of Payments Canada. And uh, just really quick, membership in Payments Canada includes, let's just highlight it in case you are looking at your screen, 
So membership in Payments Canada includes the Bank of Canada and domestic banks and authorized foreign banks. Now here we have Payments Canada directly from the website, how cross-border payments are evolving. In the summary, with cross-border transactions having accounted for 23.7 trillion USD globally in 2018, the bulk of which consisted of corporate payments, the need for payment systems operators and payment service providers to facilitate seamless cross-border payments at scale has never been greater. Particularly, the continued expansionary growth in e-commerce, both B2B and P2B, cross-border retail payments, which we tend to focus on with the Stellar system, further highlights this need for more attention to be placed on cross-border payment activities and how the ecosystem is evolving and finding efficiencies with which to facilitate such transactions. So in this payments perspective, we offer a summary survey of methods to affect cross-border payments. Specifically, we highlight some of the key channels through which cross-border payments are made, their advantages and disadvantages. We also touch on developments in the industry such as SWIFT, GPI, and the ongoing efforts to affect cross-border funds transfer using digital currencies from Project Jasper, Ubin, to JP Morgan's Interbank Information Network and Facebook's Libra. Now here's something I want to pull up really quick too. As I've said from day one, you know, stable coins, a lot of people tend to misunderstand that. They get so emotional, they can't comprehend even the definition of what something means. There are different levels of that, which we've shown over multiple videos, but just going into this here. Stablecoins for cross-border payment. Stablecoin refers to a class of digital currencies which are relatively stable in terms of their price. And remember, as far as investing, do not get emotionally attached to your investment. What you want to be emotionally attached to is your goal, which your investment is going to help you achieve. Now back into the article, stablecoins offer instantaneous processing and security of payments as many cryptocurrencies do. They also offer stability with respect to their party against fiat currencies. Two, one, two, digital currencies that fall into this category are RippleNet's native digital currency Ripple XRP and Stellar Network's native cryptocurrency, the Stellar Lumen XLM. Both Ripple and Stellar enable faster and more efficient cross-border payments relative to correspondent banking. However, they differ in that Ripple is focused on improving cross-border settlement between international banks, whereas Stellar is focused on providing low-cost cross-border payment financial services to the end user and the unbanked population. Now, again, you can see for me, this is old news. And for you, this may be new news or reminder. If you've never seen that, you can see why I've continued to explain this from day one of this channel. Ripple is focused on the institutional, the enterprise, the wholesale. And Stellar is representing the unbanked, retail, and underbanked population of the world. So this is a big difference. You can see they are not competition. And I personally, I don't see how anyone can own Stellar without owning XRP and vice versa. I don't see how anyone can like XRP and not hold XLM. Different lanes, different focus, but together they complete the entire financial sector for their design. They're in a different lane from other assets where others are focused on different areas. For example, XTC is focused on trade different area. VeChain, VET, is focused on the supply chain, and it is also the exclusive supply chain for the APAC region, and the APAC region holds 60% of the Earth's, the global population. Now back into the article really quick. Ripple enables multinational corporations to settle cross-border payments by transferring XRP through the Ripple network, resulting in on-demand liquidity and that's where you're getting the ODL your on-demand liquidity see also there's a lot here we can continue to go but I don't want to make this video too long and lose you here because there's a lot of power in this but feel free to click the links below they're always provided for every single article that we discuss for you to go back and view at your own pleasure and leisure time if you like to read or feel free to just play the video again so that you can re-learn, relive, and re 
hear the excitement involved with these two assets. Again, that is why they're my favorite. Of course, I like XRP. XLM is basically the same thing with a broader vision. So again, that's why they are my top two favorites. And to be transparent, I do hold about 15 or so assets, but these two from day one and always will remain my top two favorites. So by contrast, Stellar enables the individual, the end user, to trade money directly with each other across jurisdictions using entrusted intermediaries to handle FX and funds transfers. The transaction confirmation time using Stellar has been observed to range from 1,000 transactions per second to approximately 10,000 transactions per second in the 2016 Barclays Africa and Deloitte pilot. Stellar's transaction fees remained a fixed rate at 0.000001 XLM per transaction, thereby making XLM cost-effective for retail cross-border transactions. And if uh, any of you, probably that's a question, do any of you hold Ethereum? Next question, have you ever tried to move Ethereum from an exchange to a wallet? Next question, have you ever tried to move Ethereum from a wallet. Let's go further, a step further. It could even be an ERC20 token. Now, have you tried to move that from a wallet back to an exchange, whether to trade it or to sell it and cash out? Do those fees look anything like the fees of XRP or XLM? The Ripple and Stellar fee reduction rates are so much more unbelievable. Now, if as a retail investor, if that's significant to you, and you're probably moving, you know, your single transaction daily, or maybe weekly or monthly or even annually, but a typical bank is moving millions and millions of transactions annually, it's very significant. So imagine your one transaction. And then the bank's multiple transactions, how much money that's going to save them and the speed and time versus a three to five day transaction time for the uh, clearance and settlement of a, you know, for example, a transaction versus three to five seconds. It's very, very significant. So there's a lot more I could go into. Again, let's keep moving forward. Here we have Ripple Pilots, a private ledger for central banks launching CBDCs. And then just slightly getting into it, the CBDC challenge and then the CBDC private ledger and basically defining future money. I want to highlight this really quick and then I'll make my point. Time to define the future of money. Ripple has a proven track record of successfully connecting disparate payment systems championing blockchain's utility to solve for global payments and is trusted by hundreds of financial institutions around the world. We are currently engaged with central banks around the world to better understand their goals and assess how the CBDC private ledger can help achieve them. We believe the solution will overcome the major challenges around creating and managing a sovereign digital currency while amplifying the value and benefits of central banks their partners, and above all, the millions of people who will use it. And again, millions of people. Let's go back to the thought we just shared. Have you ever seen the fees in moving Ethereum? And you just saw the fees for Ripple and Stellar slash XRP and XLM. Now let's read that again really quick. The central banks, their partners, and above all, the millions of people who will use it. How excited are you right now and how confident that you have the right asset for the future? And we're just getting started. We are also working on a fresh approach where central banks will be able to join a network of CBDC ledgers that enables full settlement interoperability while allowing each member to retain their monetary and technological independence. And we believe this will be a game changer for central banks and are excited to release more details on how it works very soon. And let's just highlight this title one more time. Time to define the future of money. And again, this is directly from Ripple Insights. What video did we release this week 
on the future of money. As far as global reserve currency, that is the U.S. dollar. Who signs every bit of the currency? Whose name goes on that? I believe she stated $1.6 trillion out of $1.7 trillion released Rosie Rios. Now, Rosie Rios, in video that we showed in a previous video, or I should say in a discussion in a previous video, Rosie Rios described signing the signature of the currency, stating that would be the last of this denomination before we move to the future money. And then the first thing upon leaving the treasury, now she's the board of directors for Ripple. When Ripple says thank you and congratulations, etc., for being part of the board of Ripple, welcome to the team, etc., her response stated that she was excited to be a part of Ripple. Let the future begin. How excited are you now? Now, here's another article directly from NASDAQ. Ripple touts role for XRP and central bank digital currency, white paper, etc. As you click the link, I pre-clicked it for you. Right here you have, let's see, let's go to the top really quick. Ripple, the future of CBDCs, why all central banks must take action. And then a CBDC is a sovereign equivalent of private cryptocurrencies and digital assets like Bitcoin, Ethereum, and XRP. It would be issued and controlled by a country's central bank and used by people and businesses for retail payments, much like cash, but in digital form. CBDCs will also be used for wholesale settlements in the interbank market. Again, this is older news for me, but hopefully it's news that you haven't seen at least brought to your attention in this way. And you can see again why I continue to mention the two tiers in the financial industry. You have, I'm going to highlight, please don't look at your screen if you're not safe. Retail payments, and we have wholesale settlements. So again, the retail, basically you and I, and the wholesale, which are the financial institutions. And here I want to go quickly to, um, let's go, neutral bridge currencies. While interoperability will support the direct exchange of a CBDC in domestic transactions, many of the same old issues with cross-border transactions will remain. In particular, supporting immediate real-time foreign exchanges as opposed to the current three to five day process will likely still require the need for pre-funded currency accounts and again that's what we were discussing in the previous thought where the legacy systems take three to five days the old antiquated system it's outdated it's 40 plus i believe the exact number is 47 years old and in today's world as brad garlinghouse continued to state it was much faster to just get on a plane and fly to california from the east coast than to send the money there. Or for example, I live on the East Coast and I can get into a plane and I can fly over there in less than six hours and hand you a million dollars faster than I could just send it and allow the banks to settle and clear that million dollars before you could spend it. So again, the statement goes, or the thought goes, that if we can have a man on the moon and he can text back to Earth in seconds, why can't we do the same with money? And here we go back into the article on this discussion of the, right here, let me highlight it in case you're watching, the neutral bridge currencies. And we already know what the best bridge currency is for institutions. So like any commercial bank or global business, central banks will want to avoid the increased costs and risk associated with this familiar liquidity issue. They would also welcome the ability to free up capital that would be generating or could be generating value elsewhere and skews the financial system in favor of the most liquid currencies, typically those of the most powerful nations. A neutral bridge asset can support healthy alternative liquidity markets that will allow for frictionless and cost-effective value movement between various CBDCs in real time. And we just showed you the price of 
XLM, the fee has a fixed rate per transaction. So it would also enable the exchange of less liquid CBDC pairs and increase global competition by lowering entry barriers to a new smaller market participants. To enable a truly efficient global market, a bridge currency must be specifically optimized for payments and support the same speed, scalability, low cost, and security that CBDCs will provide. One example, let me just highlight this real quick. One example of a neutral bridge is the digital asset XRP, which can be used to bridge two different currencies quickly and efficiently. So by underpinning an effective alternative liquidity market, neutral bridge currencies are the final piece of the interoperability puzzle that will drive the success of CBDCs as a global tool for exchanging value. Let's go back one more time. One example of a neutral bridge is the digital asset XRP. Now here's where I want to bring in Stellar's XLM. And the reason I highlighted this one is because IBM and Stellar had been working with central banks for years. Whether you know or whether you don't, they've already been working on this for many years. This is an article from three years ago. And IBM predicts central bank digital currency on Stellar platform soon. And of course, they already are. So most people know Stellar XLM has been partnered with IBM for some time. Recently, IBM's Jesse Lund, also at the time he has left, but the current um, CEO for IBM stated still working with Stellar. Nothing has changed in their partnership. Revealed that the firm had been working with several central banks on digital currency projects and said that a central bank digital currency will be issued soon. And IBM has been using Lumens, the native token of Stellar Blockchain, as a bridge asset to support real-time foreign exchange and settlement in what Lunds calls its cross-border payment solution, which is ostensibly aimed at commercial banks. And however, the firm is also pursuing technology that would allow for other digital assets, including digital currencies, to be used in transactions on the Stellar Blockchain as an alternative and complement to Lumens. Now, here's something I want to point out if you're unaware with the Stellar blockchain, it is required to hold XLM. So unlike a lot of other networks or systems, it's not necessarily required to use its native token, its native asset. But with Stellar, it is. And that is a major difference between many other assets and companies out there. So a few other things I want to highlight from this and we'll continue moving forward. One of the payment solutions that IBM has devised enables parties to transact without the need for any agreement in place prior to transacting because in that configuration each transaction is an atomic set of operations that either settle in real time or don't. And Lund also alluded to the possibility of tokens moving between the Stellar network and interoperable blockchains. So that is a big deal, interoperable blockchains. Another quick thing too is the uh, IBM offering its clients an added permissioned construct on top of the public Stellar network, meaning that although the Stellar blockchain is public, the firm had devised a way to establish a private platform within it where IBM has the authority to validate transactions. So again, you have Stellar as a private and public blockchain, and that is very, very important for the future of currency especially in regards to financial institution transactions. Also, too, I want to bring up Stellar Lumens gains alt crypto credit as central bank's I versatility. XLM gains haven't created the buzz of Bitcoin yet. A breakthrough could be in the offing. So Stellar is trying to work with a number of central banks to help them create cryptocurrencies, and Stellar also has a working relationship with the central bank of Ukraine as it has built its uh, central bank digital currency upon the Stellar network. Also too, there were other ones, uh, as we've discussed in video, we might go further into them at another time. But the difference between Bitcoin and Stellar is that XLM cannot be mined. 
There's no proof of work, no POW algorithm that has to be solved and in which XLM can be earned as rewards. So as we're diving down into this article, Stellar's work with central banks, the Stellar Development Foundation, which supports the Stellar Protocol, announced in early January 2021 that it had signed a deal with Ukraine's Ministry of Digital Transformation. And the work involves development of the infrastructure for a Ukrainian national digital currency. This is what is called a CBDC or a central bank digital currency. In a recent report by KPMG cited the European Central Bank and the Bank of Japan initiative called Project Stellar. The idea was to study the ability of distributed ledger technology, DLT, to process large-scale payments. DLT is the same thing as blockchain technology such as Stellar's protocol. And again, as we've discussed, digital ledger technology, it just means blockchain. And in the final article here, we have Stellar CEO. We want to be real enough when this dot-com bubble burst back from 2018 and so far they have continued to grow extensively since this article as we scroll down here just a bit i want to point out a few things too stellar is an open protocol for payments if there's a digital dollar there needs to be a real one somewhere and that's what stellar does we have a stellar consensus protocol and this is the I'm not sure how this is going to highlight together here. Let's just try it. Okay, had no trouble. Stellar Consensus Protocol. And what was the major discussion with the CBDCs was the Consensus Protocol. So that is a very significant statement right there, especially in regards to Ripple and Stellar. Another thing quick here, in the article they're discussing how Stellar better than Ethereum Jeter mentions making an asset on Stellar is easier. There's no coding involved, but you can't do whatever you want. However, 90% of what you want to do, you can do. But again, from a retail investor's perspective, how Stellar better than Ethereum? The speed is much, much faster. Stellar XLM is the fastest currency I've ever used, moving from a wallet to an exchange and vice versa. And the fee is unbelievably faster. Example, uh, getting assets off an exchange just the past week, sending USDT nearly cut the amount of USDT I was sending 30%. I believe it was much higher, but we'll be nice and conservative. At least 30% to send it I was not thinking just, uh, you know, grabbed the USDT and sent it to the exchange to get a specific asset. And then the next purchase I bought, obviously I was aware from getting hit with such an immense fee. I just used XLM, sent it there, traded it, and then got the asset that I wanted. So for me, how stellar better than Ethereum? Let's go with speed and fees. Whichever order you prefer is absolutely fine. And again, guys, I'm going to conclude this video. But remember, it's not financial advice. It's for entertainment purposes only. But I think it's very significant. And if you hold XRP and XLM, continue to know what you hold. Current price has nothing to do with the long-term value. This is two of the most amazing assets in the entire industry, even though the price seems very minimal now. As things began to see clarity to where they can do what they're meant to do, the price will then catch up to its value. And before we go, I want to leave you with a final thought. Success is not final. Failure is not fatal. It is the courage to continue that counts. And I want to say thanks to our VIP on Patreon, Surfmeister. And to each and every one of you, please hit that like and subscribe and we will catch you in the next one.